Here we go. Welcome, everybody. Um, glad to have you all here. Welcome to Art, Beanie Babies, and NFTs. How, how NFTs are like Beanie Babies, but not in the way you think. I'm really excited to uh, welcome uh, my friend, uh, Mika Marple, a fantastic artist, curator, uh, former gallerist, uh, one someone who came from deep within the art world, uh, but has been producing really fantastic artwork um, in the NFT space, in the digital art space uh, over the last couple of years, and has some really fantastic insights about that. Um, she also has uh, kind of a really sort of like fun and fresh perspective um, on, on kind of like what makes this whole thing run, what happened uh, in the NFT uh, the NFT bubble, um, where it is now and where it's going and uh, how uh, things like Beanie Babies can actually kind of inform some of the, uh, the, the trends that we're seeing and some of the things we might see in the near future. Um, so I will not take up too much more time with the introduction. I will hand it over to Mika. Um, I will say, if you have questions, if this inspires uh, thoughts, drop them into the QA and we will have that conversation after the presentation. And Mika, take it away. Hi. <laughs> well, okay, let's get started. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, Josh has been so cool to be on this wild NFT ride with you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we met almost exactly a, a year ago. Um, and yeah, so my name is Mika Marple. I'm an artist, uh, writer, a curator, um, entrepreneur, and I'm really excited to share my presentation on art, Beanie Babies and NFTs, which um, I've kind of put in a, like a five part narrative format. And um, for the sake of time, I'll just, I'll jump right into it. So part one, the backstory. Uh, last December, I was seven months pregnant uh, with my first child. And, you know, this was, uh, a month or so after the FTX collapse where billions of dollars of crypto um, went up in smoke with no recourse for, for the people that sort of lost everything. Um, I think Trump had just launched an NFT collection that was somehow doing very well because or despite the chaos. Um, so needless to say, NFTs were getting a pretty bad rap. Um, but uh, at that point, I've been in NFTs for about two, two years. Um, and I still was a, a huge believer in the technology. Um, but anyway, on my baby, on my baby moon um, with my husband, I read this book, uh, Originals by Adam Grant. And um, because I have this sort of guilty pleasure of reading sort of corporate business books. But there was this really in interesting anecdote about this man, Rufus Griscom, who had a startup. Um, and when he went about raising money for it, he used this kind of anti-sales sales tactic. His pitch deck was five reasons why not to invest in his company. Um, and it was really smart because one, it addressed the skepticism that the investors were um, coming to the table with, you know, investors are always looking for a reason why not to invest. Um, and in addressing that skepticism, he kind of disarmed, disarmed them and was able to make a really good case why he, they actually should invest um, sort of surreptitiously. And he ended up raising money and then basically did the same thing all over again years later when he sold that company to Disney. So I thought this was really clever and I tried to <laughs> my own stab at it. Um, I, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote this email to, a, um, a place where I'd, I'd written a lot of NFT articles, um, over the past, uh, year. And so I'll just say an unusual NFT article pitch. Um, I thought it would be great to write a 10 reasons to not buy NFTs article. It would at its heart still be a pro NFT piece, but it could be a cheeky way to acknowledge all the 
crypto NFT craziness that's happened recently. And, and then about two hours later, I got this response. Hi, Mika. Thanks for reaching out. Unfortunately, I think we have to hold off on this one. This is probably a little too cheeky for us, and we've put a pause on NFT content for the time being. <laughs> and you can tell from the fact that I've included this in my webinar that I had a strong emotional reaction to this uh, response. And, um, you know, cheeking it, like being too cheeky is fair enough, um, but that they would put a pause on NFT content um, was really uh, disappointing because I felt that they, you know, they were kind of respond, like they couldn't see past the, the negative noise to the potential of NFTs that I saw and really like paying someone to write an NFT article or a sort of anti slash pro NFT article is it's like the least risky way of staying engaged. Um, so basically the, this idea, I think never left my subconscious and is ultimately uh, has kind of taken, become this webinar. Um, and that's in some ways my goal is to sort of, you know, say why I'm a believer in NFTs despite all this by, by talking about, um, by comparing them to Beanie Babies, which was the, the like the main way people disparaged NFTs. Uh, you can see, this is just a handful of some of the articles um, out there comparing NFTs to Beanie Babies. And they didn't mean it in a good way, as you can see in this article. Um, but before I kind of go further down that, I thought this is part two. Wait, are my Beanie Babies worth anything? So to back up, uh, I had a lot of Beanie Babies as a kid. I, um, I was in like fourth, fifth, sixth grade when the Beanie Baby bubble was happening. So I was a kind of prime target. I think between me and my brother, we had 100 Beanie Babies. Um, and you know, basically like I hadn't thought about Beanie Babies since that time. Um, you know, I entered middle school, I got interested in boys, I kind of stopped thinking about Beanie Babies, but then all of a sudden with all these articles, I was, uh, Beanie Babies kind of entered my radar for the first time in 30 years. Yeah, so here's a picture, like a sort of creepy picture of me and my brother with some of our Beanie Babies um, back in the nineties. and. So that, that uh, after my baby moon, I spent Christmas with my parents um, and was, you know, I assumed based on these articles uh, comparing NFTs to Beanie Babies, basically saying that both were worthless, that my Beanie Babies weren't worth anything. So, you know, why not um, give them to my daughter and put, you know, make them a cute addition to her nursery and uh, cut off the tags that I've been saving, you know, so diligently for 30 whatever years. <laughs> um, but then my husband being who he is, looked up some of the Beanie Babies I had online and found out that a lot of Beanie Babies were listed for a lot of money. Uh, you can see here, this princess is listed for a million dollars. And while it has zero bids and a lot of the Beanie Babies that were listed for a lot of money had zero bids. Um, while I didn't think my princess bear was worth a million dollars, it did make me think that maybe it wasn't worthless, like toilet paper, as some uh, Beanie Baby memes will have it. And so I decided like, you know, like, it's, you know, F my daughter's nursery. Like I wanna, you know, make money off these Beanie Babies. <laughs> if I can. And so I started to like see, you know, if I had valuable Beanie Babies and like how much I could get from them. Um, but it was really confusing and I couldn't figure it out. You know, like there were some articles that said that the Princess Bear was worth $10,000. Um, but then there were other sites like this, sell to bbnovelties.com. 
that book by Beanie Babies and they wouldn't pay more than $2 for a princess bear. So I was just really confused. Like was my princess bear worth $2 or $10 or you know, $2,000? Um, I felt like I kind of reached the limit of my own research um, or like the limit from like a quick Google. Um. So I decided to, to reach out to um, a couple of Beanie Baby appraisers, <laughs> which is a thing and there are multiple of them. And yeah, this is a picture of me at eight months pregnant, um, meeting with an appraiser over Zoom, holding up a Beanie Baby to in front of her, uh, showing her the tush tag, as you can see here, which matters when you're determining the value of a Beanie Baby. And yeah, it, it was it was really interesting and and then I I didn't stop there I couldn't stop you know once I met with the appraisers that all these questions started to come up like why were some beanie babies worth more than others and you know why why had they been valuable at all ever you know what had caused this craze and so I started to read um, I started to almost become my own appraiser. I read this book, it's a great book, The Great Beanie Baby Bubble by Zach Bizanet, really well researched, um, talks a lot about Ty Warner who owns Ty Inc, uh, who manufactured the Beanie Babies um, and the whole bubble and a lot of the psychology behind it um, that came out in like 2014 or so. And I watched this great HBO documentary on Beanie Babies that came out at the end of 2021. Um, and yeah, I just sort of became obsessed with Beanie Babies. Um, and I think, you know, in retrospect, it had a lot to do with almost like trying to understand my own childhood and the sort of in, invisible forces or the forces that I had been too young to perceive at the time and trying to understand, you know, how they had actually shaped my reality um, back then. Oh yeah, so I fall down a Beanie Baby rabbit hole um, pretty hard. And, you know, I think what was like almost more interesting than the prices that Beanie Babies were being listed at was just the sheer amount of activity, whether it was fake or not. I mean, even the fake activity is an indicator of something. I just like couldn't believe that there was so much energy being poured into Beanie Babies online um when i had when they really hadn't been on my radar and it made me think that maybe there's a beanie baby resurgence happening and then i get i went about trying to find uh, evidence to support this intuition and i found it so this is a google trends uh screenshot of the beanie baby term and you can see that it's increased like three four fold since uh 2010 and um, I used the Wayback Machine to find out the number of Beanie Baby listings in 2015-16 um, compared to the amount today, which, and they, ca they cap it at 500,000 and it's at least um, increased, you know, five fold. So definitely something is happening. Um, and again, it really got me asking like, why, why is, um, Oh yeah, there's a movie being made about Beanie Babies, uh, Ty Warner and the women in his life, uh, who he largely exploited, uh, starring Zach Galifianakis and Elizabeth Banks, um, and more on that later. Um, but yeah, like why? Why Beanie Babies? Why you know why? Uh, why not Tamagotchis or or Pogs or the Macarena or you know any of these like '90s. Uh, trends uh, you know why are beanie babies coming back and why now um and in my research i was like just really reminded about what just what a what a just like the sheer scale of the phenomenon it was it's mind-boggling is i mean in 1998 ty warner sold 1.4 billion dollars worth of beanie babies that's approximately 560 million beanie babies I mean, it's hard to even grasp. In 1997, uh, Mary Beth Zobolewski, 
uh, who is very important in the Beanie Baby world. <laughs> Uh, she had a magazine, Mary Beth's Beanie World, self-published that had over a million subscribers. And um, she's really interesting. She's part of a handful of um, women living in the Chicago suburbs who basically ignited this Beanie Baby craze. And some of them were mothers and some of them weren't actually. Um, but one of the ways they ignited this craze was by having these checklists which are really interesting. So the way that Ty Warner worked is he would, um, he was a big perfectionist and he, he would release a Beanie Baby and then decide, you know, a couple months in that there was something about it that he didn't like that could be better and he would just change it. So all of a sudden that first generation, um, Beanie would become extremely valuable and rare. Um, he also, intentionally retired Beanie Babies that weren't doing well. So, and then they would suddenly become very desirable. And there became this obsession of um, getting the most rare Beanie Baby. And these checklists were like a huge way of, um, you know, basically determining rarity. And as you can see from this picture, it really wasn't, you know, they, Beanie, babies were, Beanie Babies were priced at $5 so that they could be bought by kids by kids with their allowance, but really it was adults that were doing all this crazy um, activity, you know, waking up at four in the morning, like stalking FedEx drivers. Um, I mean, there's so many stories like this um, that really verge on violence <laughs> in the Beanie Baby, uh, like narratives. I mean, there was a, someone was murdered over a Beanie Baby deal gone bad. Um, but yeah, so I was really like, oh, I mean, and the book really talks about this, um, you know, but I, it's so interesting that like, even though this was a kid's toy, like adults were the ones who got the most caught up with it. And again, like, I was kind of like, why? And it's really because nostalgia played a huge factor. Um, Ty Warner worked at this uh, toy store, Dakin, for 15 years before starting his own company. And they... Um, had their sort of glory days in the 50s, 60s when they produced these dream pets, um, a plush toy that was really popular. And you can see even from this um, sort of red bull, the like direct lineage between the Dakin pets and the Beanie Babies. So Beanie Babies were clearly very um, like hit on this like nostalgia uh, part of the brain uh, in a really you know, hard way <laughs> for a lot of adults. And it was like the toy that reminded them of their own childhoods that they related to more than maybe like their kids' Nintendo game system. Um, at the same time, Beanie Babies were also, the Beanie Baby bubble perfectly coincides with the dot-com bubble. So Beanie Babies, you know, I you don't think of them as a tech phenomenon, um, but they really were because they were the first e-commerce sensation. In 1998, Beanie Babies were 10% of eBay's sales. That was the year eBay IPO'd. Like they really couldn't have IPO'd without Beanie Babies. And, you know, in 1995, roughly 10% uh, of American households had a uh, computer with internet. And so internet was starting to catch on, but e-commerce was really lagging. Um, and the big reason why was because um, there was such a psychological hurdle to put your credit card information online. Um, not only that, like shipping was really uh, expensive. There wasn't the scale uh, to bring down costs. And most companies, like their websites were afterthoughts. Um, they weren't engaging. They didn't have the best inventory. And so, yeah, e-commerce, like, was this dream that was kind of like struggling to take off at the time. But Beanie Baby collectors were so obsessed that they just overcame these hurdles. And also really the places like eBay and chat rooms were the only place to get rare Beanie Babies. So um, yeah, they really like can't be separated from the technology, um, uh, like the rise of the internet and e-commerce. So really like, basically like Beanie Babies were this perfectly addictive, like 
like sugar salt combination of nostalgia for the past with excitement for the future, you know, feeling like you're sort of part of the tech avant-garde. Um, and I thought that was just like really interesting. And, you know, it's almost like when those two things come together, reason goes out the window. Um, and I probably don't even need to show this slide because we're all so familiar with e-commerce, but this shows the growth of e-commerce since the sort of big, very beginning of the Beanie Baby uh, bubble. And so even though Beanie Babies didn't hold up in value, what did is the method of distribution that enabled the craze to happen. So <laughs> I obviously saw a lot of parallels between this and the um, NFT collectibles bubble that just happened. Um, and I thought this was really interesting because I grew up in Silicon Valley and I really had this front row seat to the NFT bubble. And in some ways I also really had it with the Beanie Baby bubble, but I just, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. Um, so it was this kind of like weird, like life spiral where I'm like, oh, here I am again. Um, but let me explain. So CryptoPunks, as you can see here in the bottom right are like these pixelated cartoon, like kind of avatars. And they're directly reminiscent of these pixelated uh, characters from like Nintendo game systems from the nineties. Um, so they really also like the same way Beanie Babies hit on this nostalgic um, key, it's the same thing with um, CryptoPunks and Board Ape Yacht Club. Um, also these rarity checklists, same thing. Um, there is an obsession over, you know, the most rare uh, board ape yacht clubs were the ones that were going for millions of dollars and this obsession of like getting the most rare one um, and this kind of public, um, you know, forum for like comparing, you know, who has the more valuable rare uh, uh, PFP. And similarly, like, even though the, the images themselves are pretty uh, cartoonish and sort of juvenile in a way, it's all adults um, participating in this. And again, like you have this nostalgia for your own childhood mixed with the feeling of being a part of like the tech future um, that just is so explosive that yeah, basically like logic and reason goes out the window. And you can see this is this is a chart of the 12 most expensive NFTs ever sold, a, a recent chart. And six of the 12 most expensive NFTs are CryptoPunks. The most expensive one, you know, going for 23.7 million, which actually makes Beanie Babies look like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> um, but of course, most of that value hasn't uh, remained. <laughs> and here, here's an example of a crypto punk in a board ape yacht club that, you know, sold for ten, one tenth of what they were bought for. Uh, here is uh, the market capitalization of the board ape yacht club from April 2021 to January 2023. And you can see the shape of it is almost identical with the dot com bubble. Um, But, you know, if like you can see seeing all the ways that it's similar, you know, while it's very likely that a lot of the crypto punks and board ape yacht clubs like won't hold up or like won't reach the same heights that they had reached in 2021 and maybe the beginning of 2022, you can bet that the method of distribution, which is in this case blockchain, um, will survive. And not only will it survive, it will just grow and grow and grow. Um, and this I think is like a really interesting chart. I mean, I think what's so interesting is like, there's so much panic around NFTs. There's so much wanting to disassociate with ever having had anything to do with it as with that you know, uh, publication I pitched that we forget that this is a pattern that just is, is a known pattern that there's a technological trigger 
and it creates this uh, bubble. And then, you know, I think if we're looking at this chart here, like we're definitely in the trough of disillusionment <laughs> right now. But then there's the slope of enlightenment and it, you know, and it keeps going. Um, so that it's not really like a time to panic. It's actually like a time to really um, clear the noise and pay attention to like what's important. Um, and my takeaways, this is like the final uh, portion here. So of course, with any bubble, there's sort of quote unquote winners and quote unquote losers. Um, and, you know, definitely the people that would go under the quote unquote loser category are, you know, the people that bought at the top and then, um, yeah, you, you sell at the bottom if they sell at all. And, that definitely happened in Beanie Babies. This there's so this soap opera star Chris Robinson, yeah, spent his like life savings and his kids' college fund on Beanie Babies, and um, his son ended up making this documentary bankrupt by Beanie Babies. Um, and yeah, then and this is where usually like all the attention goes to because we love these like car crash financial stories, um, like. The, just so much like Shroud and Freuda in, in these stories. Um, and then we sort of don't pay attention to the people that like um, quietly um, escape away with all the money. And in this case, that would be Ty Warner who, you know, he became a billionaire off Beanie Babies. He owned a hundred percent of Ty Inc. Um, and then he uh, parlayed that into uh, high-end hotel real estate. He owns two Four Seasons and this is, you know, he's currently the 501st and richest person in the world. And basically the same thing happened uh, with NFTs that Yuga Labs who created Board Ape Yacht Club, they raised money recently at, that valued uh, the company at $4 billion. So even though Board Ape Yacht Club, they also own CryptoPunks actually, even though those NFTs are, haven't held up in value, the the creators and owners of it are, are doing just fine. But the people, you know, I think it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to feel bad for people that behaved so obviously recklessly uh, with their money. Um, but who I'm actually like the most interested in, um, like, bringing attention and light to are um, these women that were so so key in the igniting the phenomenon that kicked off this whole new era of technology and yet basically are uncredited, uh, let alone like weren't able to capitalize on the value that they brought. And so for Beanie Babies, that's definitely Lena Trivedi. She not only pitched including the poems um, and the swing tags for all the Beanie Babies and wrote 138 of them in like three days. She also, you know, she was about, she was in her early twenties, a college student when she joined Thai Inc um, as their 12th employee. And uh, Ty Warner himself didn't have a computer with internet at his house. So she was the one who saw all this, um, secondary market activity happening organically online through eBay and chat rooms. And she's the one who pitched to, to Ty having a website to sort of, you know, centralize some of this action and so they could capture some of the secondary, you know, market value they were creating. And this website was so ahead of its time. There was um, like every day there would be some new leaked bit of information about what the Beanie Babies, they were potentially gonna retire. Um, there was a message board for buying and selling and trading Beanie Babies. Um, and then there's a reason to go back every day. And the website was so well trafficked that, that it was constantly crashing actually. And it's really almost like a, like a proto social media website. Um, but of course, Lena Trevetti, when she asked for more money, she was paid 25 an hour, um, they wouldn't pay her more <laughs> because um, the board thought the internet was just a fad. 
And so they just, they really didn't understand the incredible value and innovation that she was bringing. And she ended up walking away. Uh, Megan Doyle is another woman who actually is the one who originally suggested auctioning an NFT uh, at Christie's. And it's not even a secret. Uh, Noah Davis, who is the man most associated with uh, the Beeple sale, like the Christie's employee most associated with it, um, even says in this Guardian interview, my brilliant colleague Megan Doyle shouted across the aisle, hey, would you put an NFT in your sale? And said Davis, I said, yes, but I barely knew what an NFT was. So this, I mean, Noah Davis didn't even know what an NFT was. <laughs> There's a woman that, that even had this sort of ingenuity to see that this could be a big thing for um, the traditional art market. And of course, it's what led to the watershed moment of um, Beeple's $69 million sale, which essentially brought NFTs into the mainstream. Um, and I just think it's so interesting that like, even though, you know, Noah Davis doesn't even, this isn't a secret, he's not trying to hide it. It still is just completely overshadowed um, and is not part of the sort of Beeple lore, like the $69 million sale that, um, yeah, it's just sort of been like erased out of it. Uh, and this really brings me back to my practice because this is, this is what I'm really interested in uh, as an artist and a writer uh, and even an entrepreneur. Um, I made this collection called the Medusa Collection, which was a generative art project uh, with NFTs that I worked, used code to create a, like 2,500 rent, like unique randomly generated um, digital paintings. And this whole project was about reframing the Medusa myth because I had learned uh, that Medusa was actually a rape victim, that she had been raped by Poseidon. And then when his wife, Athena, found out, she is the one who turned her into a monster and um, banished her to a cave. So this person we think of as the quintessential female monster uh, is actually the survivor of sexual assault. And this, again, like, it's not even a secret um, of the Greek myth. Like, if you look at Ovid's Metamorphosis, which our modern understanding of Medusa is based on, it's right there in the text, but it's just the part, we just don't give it any attention. Um, and so this is like, a, I really, you know, if I have like one goal in life is to <laughs> bring attention to where attention should be going. Um, and I really, you know, I think if we really like need to spend less time looking at these kind of um, looking slash laughing at the horror stories <laughs> that come from bubbles um, and more time looking at the women who, who really, kicked off these new eras of technology. Um, and then just this, um, I just became an advisor for this uh, startup exhibited at, which is putting uh, ex an artworks exhibition history in the blockchain, which I also think is just a really feminist act, like making sure that these histories uh, and stories aren't forgotten um, just because we're going at this breakneck speed. Oh yeah, so what? <laughs> What I really know what everyone's here to find out, am I a beanie baby billionaire? And so the answer is no, um, I will not be getting rich off my beanie babies. And as one of the appraisers uh, pointed out that as far as princess goes, made in China with PE pellets is the most common and least valuable one. It's typically sold between 10 and $20. And when I looked on eBay for, you can search um, actual sold lots that certainly seemed to be accurate, if not a bit high. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> my daughter gets my BB babies um, and I will happily cut off the tags, even though I haven't done that in this picture. But, you know, really like, I just to like wrap up, um, you know, like even though my Beanie Babies aren't worth anything, like this whole uh, deep dive obsession was so valuable to me because I was, it was such a reminder of, you know, how much studying the past can really help us understand the present moment 
um, make sense of it and hopefully bring about awareness that makes it so the future can be different. Um, and that's like really what I want for, for me and for my daughter is a, a future where women's contributions um, are, are, are not only credited, but, but valued. Um, and yeah, where women can basically capture the value they bring. And that's my presentation. And thanks so much for having me. All right. Okay. Thanks, Mika. That was fantastic. <laughs> okay, so um, I would say if anybody has any questions, uh, absolutely throw them in the uh, the, the Q and A uh, thing down below. I'll see if there's any questions here. Uh, but otherwise, I have like plenty of questions that uh, that I could have, and certainly like there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for conversation here. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that was really interesting to me about the NFT thing, which is which is like slightly different than, than Beanie Babies was that it happened like right during COVID. Um, and I think there was like this huge aspect of community um, where, you know, people were like in these like discords and they were like all like in these like com these communities around these PFP projects um, and like, and felt like a sense of belonging when all of us were like basically like stuck at home. Um, and then like, you know, you had mentioned, you know, some of those like um, buying circles of Beanie Babies in Chicago, you know, like, it seems like community has like a major part to play in this. And I'm just like, super curious, like how you think about that. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, I think that's, uh, it's so good. I actually hadn't like thought about this parallel, but it, there definitely is one. So I, you know, I think um, Mary Beth Sobolewski, who had Mary Beth's Beanie World, like she was like a like a Lockheed engineer or something before she became a stay at home mom. Um, you know, she was like extremely brilliant, talented uh, woman. And I can only imagine that, you know, like she felt sort of like not trapped, but like not like she there were sides of her that she wasn't using as a as a stay at home mother. And that, and this was kind of like the outlet for it. You know, this was like where she got to like, in some ways, like uh, use her brilliance, her like analytical brilliance. And, you know, I know one is compare being a stay at home mom to a uh, pandemic, but there is a certain, you know, you're sort of forced to stay home. I kind of, um, love, I kind of love that. And analogy. I do think like, you kind of think of ways to get your needs met any somehow anyway you know and yeah. um in some ways it's just like a testament to all like our resourcefulness as human beings yeah it was so funny because like i you know I, I think everyone has like their sort of parallel like like for me i wasn't into bd babies but like i had like long boxes of comic books that i thought was gonna be like my retirement like i thought like you know like yeah. x-men number 123 would be like you know what i'd be buying cars with today um and like in in some ways like you know, I like it was it was a crap investment, and I like didn't need to put everything in those like like bags. But like, I also like really enjoyed it during the time. Like, I took like a, I did read them, and I had took a lot of pleasure. And like, I think yeah. that's also something that sometimes gets dismissed in all this, which is like these things are fun. Like, it's fun to be in those in the in in that hype cycle. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, collecting is fun. You know, I mean, I um used to I used to be like a high end art dealer, and like there's this kind of idea that that collectors of Beanie Babies or NFTs or even of traditional art, like they only collect as investment. Um, but I actually think they collect because collecting itself is fun and and there's a whole um, community around it and, and it's sort of a gamified. And yeah, it's just kind of, it's like something to do that's, that's, um, I don't know, there's like delight in it too. So it's like, of course these collectors would like their artwork to go up in value, but the truth is like art is not really a good investment asset. And it's not really on a deep level, I think why collectors buy art. I think they do it because because collecting is fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny too, because like I, I, you know, in the art world, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all this art and you know and a lot of times I have to sort of like 
just like justify and be like, well, look, why is this valuable? I'm like, well, why is anything valuable? Like you, you end up getting like very meta. You're like, wait, why am I valuable? Why like, you know, and you're like, oh, these are all just like really bizarre human constructs. Yeah, totally. Is there a question there? Is that no, just there totally isn't. Thing? There totally <laughs> isn't. <laughs> I'm just ramping on that. Um, yeah, there, there was a question in the Q&A, um, you know, there were about the partnership that Beanie Babies had with McDonald's. And I think there's also like, there's, you know, and, you know, I, I think it's also, there's definitely corollaries to like, you know, board yacht, board Ape yacht clubs has partnerships with everybody. Um, yeah. and I kind of, I kind of wonder if you thought a little bit about those sort of like corporate relationships and how that plays into this. Yeah. It's super interesting. Actually. Um, yeah. The teeny beanies. Um, yeah. How can they forget about the teeny beanies, but they were, they, I think they, um, for the first run in 1997, they made a hundred thousand teeny beanies that they expected. It was like one for every household in America and they expected it to last five weeks and it, and it sold out in two. I mean, there's so many stories of people just like going to McDonald's, buying eight happy meals, and then just like throwing the meals in the garbage and then going to the next McDonald's and like doing the same thing all over. And yeah, it's interesting because actually it was like one of the, I mean, I guess Ty, during the Beanie Baby bubble, because I think Ty is like not so involved with Ty Inc. anymore, but during like the height of their popularity, he was super picky about partnerships and um, like they wanted to make a Beanie Baby TV show and movie and he turned it down. Um, so McDonald's was like one of the few partnerships he actually did. Um, and that was interesting because in that way that uh, in some ways Beanie Babies were this they were sold only at specialty toy stores and kind of it was more like a middle and upper class phenomenon and then when they the teeny babies happened it was just like it was everybody like the whole world uh didn't matter what economic class you were like you knew you had or knew about beanie babies yeah well and it's also but it's it's so interesting in that like you know, I, I think there's like a lot of uh, temptation to make things ubiquitous and like, you know, blow it up as big as possible. But then it's like, once you blow it up past a certain part point, it seems like not be special anymore, you know, or, yeah. or it gets away from that kind of like core, that core group that kind of holds it together. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I mean, it definitely like flooded and that's a big parallel with NFTs too, you know, like there is so, like there are 10,000 crypto punks and 10,000 board ape yacht clubs and and then all of a sudden there was like a whole bunch of 10K, like, you know, not like doppelganger projects, but like so many people trying to replicate that success with another 10K project. And there's just like, I don't know how many of these NFT collectible projects there are now, but there must be like millions. Oh yeah. And there's just, there's just not enough people to collect them all, you know, like it just, they just flooded the market. Um, yeah. Totally. It's just like too, too uh, greedy or I don't know if it's greedy, but it's just like, yeah, it's this exuberance that again, like where reason just kind of goes out the window and, and then now there's no, no one is releasing 10 K projects right now. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I saw all those like, like in LinkedIn and Twitter, all the PFP, like, you know, uh, avatars just sort of like disappearing. disappearing. And, yeah. then, and, then it's, and then it's like suddenly like these like AI mid journey selfies. You're like, oh, oh yeah. I got one. Yeah. <laughs> you have one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I just, I just had, <laughs> yeah. I honestly, I just been lazy to get a new headshot. So I was like, I'll just do this. Yeah. Um, so, you but know, I, I guess, oh, yeah, on, sorry, sorry. Go. No, but I just like want to bring it to that, like one chart that I showed where it's like, there's, yeah. there's always a bubble. And then, and then there's like a slow, you know, like uh growth after that's more sustainable. And so I just think it's so interesting. Like, even though we've lived through this so many times, like people always want to distance themselves and dis like disassociate with um the bubble, even though the bubble itself is like actually in some ways um validates the technology totally. that, that is um underpinning it. Uh, so that that's why I just like I can't even believe it when people just like they're so in and then they're so out and it's yeah there's just like no kind of um, sort of more zoomed out vision of what's happening. Well, it's like, I think it's so funny because it's like 
people, you know, it's like, people, I'm sure people said the same thing about e-commerce, you know, when there was like e-commerce bubble, I'd be like, okay, pets.com is out of business, you know, like e-commerce is dead, like e-commerce yeah. did fine, you know, like, yeah. like delivering like a 50 pound bag of dog food for no shipping costs, like doesn't make as much sense, yeah. you know? And it's like, I, I feel like it's the same thing now. It's like blockchain is like inevitable, but like maybe, maybe the, maybe like a PFP project of a pudgy penguin wasn't like where you should have put your money. Yeah, like certainly not, you know, like a hundred thousand or <laughs> whatever. Yeah, totally. but, <laughs> but but yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think, I mean, that's what makes me so happy about art world because I think in some ways, especially the traditional art world, like they didn't love NFTs to begin with, but they sort of, the bubble kind of made them feel like, oh God, I have to deal with this. And then now yeah. that it's over, they're like, oh, phew, like I don't, like I don't have to deal with this anymore. <laughs> Thank God we did play that. And, um, and I'm just like, that is, you're not, you're missing it. You're not like seeing what's really happening. Totally. And so it just makes me happy that like art world is like still going strong and sort of doing better than ever. Um, Cause I well, feel like you and NATO really get that, that this is a, this is a long-term play. And. So, yeah. so I, I'll put it back on you. So as an NFT artist or as an artist that has done NFTs, like how are you using your trough of disillusionment? <laughs> um, how am I using my trough of disillusionment? Well, I'm like, I've, it's funny. Like I'm, I'm trying to, like I'm also a painter. So I'm like a traditional yeah. artist and an NFT artist. Oh. And I'm, um, I feel like even I also just got really sucked into NFTs when all the craziness was happening. So I'm I'm trying to actually have like a more well-balanced relationship where I'm like making um, as much, like I'm equally engaged with the traditional art world and sort of my paintings and the NFT world and NFTs, and then increasingly trying to see like where they can converge um, because that's really, that's what I'm like most excited about and like looking forward to. Very cool. Very cool. Um, there's a question in the QA to talk a little bit more about the exhibited at uh, work. Oh, that you're yeah. Doing. Yeah. What, what, can, you tell, can you tell me more about it? Yeah. Um, so, so Rodenia like, Young, uh, the founder, uh, she actually worked at Christie's um, too, which is interesting. And she had to do so with a lot of um, a lot of her job was like finding the sort of provenance and exhibition history of works because it just was never well documented. And that's kind of how the traditional art world works, like sometimes intentionally, sometimes in 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 intentionally, unintentionally. <laughs> um, there's just a lot of opacity and, you know, it just makes for a very inefficient business. Um, it also sort of allows for a lot of bad behavior to happen. Um, anyway, and her, so her job was trying to like, um, verify an artworks as exhibition history sort of um, retroactively and exhibited at is basically, I think to try to make it so that, um, so exhibition history is actually attached to the artwork itself. And basically it carries its history with it and the history is written in real time. Oh, interesting, um, okay, cool. Yeah, and so that to me like, to me, I actually feel is the future of record keeping in general. Yeah. And also like just a big reason, a big problem with the art world record keeping, it's, it's all siloed and no one, it's not, people don't keep it in the same way. And so it's just really hard to like have your sort of database, like meet another person's database. And people are so like territorial about their databases anyway. And to me, just the future of record keeping is, is on the blockchain, it's decentralized. Um, it can be looked at by anybody um, or, or it can be private and encrypted, but it's not um, just like for efficiency's sake, like, you know, there's just like, I know public, I feel like the public record keeping part of NFTs is like yet to be really mined. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, so I'm actually, I'm here in Austin, Texas at consensus, which is like the crazy web three thing. And it's like the, the difference in conversation between like NFT NYC, like some of those like hype bubble parties, you know, with like all the like, yeah, I'm like going to invest in like an obese whale, you know, PFP project, <laughs> you know, like versus like 
the people who are like building the blockchain is yeah. so different. It's like so different, you know? And it's like, and I think about like, just like the level of sophistication of like the person in like the nineties who was like, I'm going to invest everything in this like beanie and like a bunch of stuffed animals. Cause like, that's going to make me rich versus the yeah. people that could like see the layer below it and be like, Oh no, this yeah. has to do with like a transformative technology. Yeah. Um, you know, and like those people fare very differently, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause actually I, we met recently with, um, the head of uh, Christie's that has, um, a, a venture fund they started, um, it, which is really interesting actually, because they're, they're basically investing in companies that they use because they realized that they were bringing so much value to these companies and not capturing it. Um, totally. but you know, I was listening to the, the head of it, Devan Thakar, and he was talking about, he invests in picks, uh, picks and shovels companies. And what he means by that is um, during the gold rush, the California gold rush you know, in 1849, the people that really got rich were not the gold miners. They were the people selling picks and shovels to the gold miners. Totally. Um, and so that's kind of like what I'm looking at and interested at, like how, like, like I love the art, obviously. Like I love good art. Um, yeah. but I think it's like what almost what's more interesting is like what enables art to thrive and what um what like under underpins it. Yeah, I thought you know it's it's so tricky because it's like I I've run into this both at Art World and like Blue Cadet, which is that like I'm very drawn to stuff that's like charismatic and interesting to me, and it's like yeah. I know that blockchain and like that stuff is like way more interesting, and like I know that if I like subscribe to like the consensus newsletter I would like probably make more money but like god damn it I don't care like yeah. it's like I just love art and I love this like it's like you know I love yeah. it, you know, it's like it's like I was like I you know it's like part of me is like ah you know like you probably would have made more money if you're paying attention to e-commerce it was probably a lot of fun to buy all this crap and you know, all these beanie babies yeah well I think it's like you find you find like it's like you don't want to ever not be your authentic self but I think totally. like when you have this knowledge it can inform sort of like what the potential you see in different things, you know, yeah. like if there was an e-commerce thing or around like comics in the nineties, like maybe that would have been really, <laughs> you know, like I know, I know, the totally. right <laughs> No, it's totally, and, you know, it, and I think, I think I like, maybe the big takeaway from all of this is that like, I do think that like web three and like the blockchain is like inevitable, you know, yeah. and like all this stuff that happened, like, is signaling that, you know? Yeah. And I and I think there's some, I mean, at least for me, and I'm sure you're seeing this too, like there's some really exciting things like that 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 hasn't played out yet. Yeah. No, and in, I mean, just like even go back to this Christie's Ventures thing, like yeah. they just recently formed that fund. Mm -hmm. They're very aware of this pattern and they know yeah. that like now they get a discount when they invest in companies and they just, they know that this is the future. So like, it's just very interesting um, you know, the people that are aware of this pattern, like they, they can end up like really benefiting from it. Um, and yeah, I think it was like something like always like Google, I think happened right after the dot-com burst. Um, like there's so many, I don't know, like, like now is kind of the most exciting time, um, in the whole sort of NFT ecosystem. Like now is when the things that get built and like really shape the world to come are, are being built. Yeah, and it's also the culture is a lot better too. Cause like all the Ibiza yeah. party bros are, are, out of the, are out of the room, you know? Like, yeah. and it's like, like the people who are at, like the builders, the people who are like in it for the right reasons seem to be still present. Um, at least that's been my observation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the noise is sort of like the distraction is gone. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I have a question for you, though. Are you collect? Yeah. Are you still collecting NFTs? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I definitely am like, I mean, I think uh, when my daughter was born, I bought this NFT from the Verse Verse that was. Um, oh, they're awesome. Yeah. Um, um, about, you know, motherhood. So I, <laughs> I had to get it. Um. Yeah, I mean, like now is like probably like a really great time to buy NFTs because they're they're not the prices are pretty reasonable. They're more realistic. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I have slowed. 
down. I will say that. Um, yeah. But that's also partly because I just had a daughter. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Kids are super expensive. They, they, they divert a lot of spending, I've, I've noticed. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think that's actually another thing I would just like to sort of like signal out to everybody, which is that like, there's some really like there, there are like, some, there were some bad players and there was probably like some like sketchy projects, but like, like people like Sasha Styles, like there's some brilliant people in the, oh, yeah. in the space and like they're worth supporting and there's some great, I, I personally love, I, I, I've actually probably accelerated my, my NFT spending recently. Oh, amazing. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Well, I got a little bit. Of, I got a little bit of ETH from a secondary sale, and then I'm starting to like, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, anyway. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh shoot, we got like two minutes left, so um, I think we could wrap up here. Any and, and one, any last questions for the Q and A? Anybody want to drop one in? Okay. No. Otherwise, Mika, this was awesome. This is so, thank you so, so much for doing this. Really, yeah. really, really appreciate it. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we will have a another one of these webinars uh, next week um, on Hollywood fiction to near future immersive with uh, Territory Studio, uh, Dave and Sheldon Hicks. Take a look at their stuff. Take a look at their site. They do a lot of like crazy VR, VFX stuff or things like Blade Runner. Um, but then they're also like actually like designing like dashboards for like the new Audi. So it's uh, it's uh, it's good fun. Uh, kind of like where the the future and the present meet. Um, again, Mika, many many thanks. Uh, I will see you see you back you. in LA, and we'll uh, yeah. talk soon. Thank you all for joining me. Hope to see you again on another uh, one of these uh, webinars. Yeah, thank you for all having right. me. Oh, absolutely, pleasure. Day.